good afternoon uh, everyone and welcome uh, good morning if you've joined from the uk or somewhere in europe and good evening if you've joined from uh, southeast asia um, welcome everyone my name is varun malik uh, i'm the ceo of consolidon uh, consolidon is a new age consulting firm uh, we like to say powered by a digital platform. Uh, we work with a lot of clients across the region, help them with strategy, uh, essentially on the advisory side, governance, uh, risk advisory, et cetera. And we love hosting information sessions, webinars like this, get uh, a few like-minded people on one call. Um, you will see that this is a little bit tip different from a typical information session or webinar because we use Zoom meetings. We do that purposely so that uh, you can unmute yourself, ask questions, interact with us um, during the discussion. We, of course, look forward to connecting with a lot of you after the session as well. Um, so very uh, you know, briefly, uh, I'll make quick introductions to the two partners uh, who are with us here today, Girish and Nirav. Uh, Girish is a managing partner at MCA. Um, he will introduce MCA briefly during, the, uh, during his presentation as well. But uh, as a personal introduction, he's been in, uh, in the finance area for the last 30 plus years, uh, worked with several large uh, brands and names in the region. Uh, his last role was at Enoch, where he was um, heading finance for uh, one and several of their businesses, actually. And he joined MC a few years back and now heads their tax uh, advisory. Uh, Nirav uh, has moved recently to, to the UAE. He has significant experience in managing tax uh, in several of the big four firms, as well as uh, end clients uh, in India. And now he's moved here to the region to help clients in the region with, uh, with their tax uh, concerns and uh, tax requirements. Uh, so welcome uh, Girish and Nirav. We're really looking forward to hearing from you today, learning from you. Uh, just some quick ground rules for the audience. Please stay on mute during the uh, discussion. If you'd like to have your videos on, that's absolutely fine. We'd love to see you get a few of the reactions. Keep uh, posting your questions on the chat um, because we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the discussion. So we're going to run this session, the presentation for about 40 minutes from now. So till about 3.45 and we've left 15 minutes towards the end to answer any questions. Um, we're tr this is an information session, so we won't get into very specific uh, cases like some of the questions that you asked about, but we will try and answer them on one-on-one -on -one discussions. We're very, very open to that. Uh, love sharing knowledge, love having discussions around some of the topics we're passionate about and that we have expertise in. Um, uh, so feel free to type out your questions and we'll answer them uh, at the end. Uh, you will see my colleague Alvin posting a few notes in the, in the chat during the discussion. Uh, I think there will be three posts from him during the discussion, one at around 20 minutes, one at around 35 minutes and one at around 50 minutes at these three marks. Um, the first two are invites to join our ecosystem. We have an ecosystem of over 500, actually it's a lot bigger now, it's almost 900 consulting firms and individual consultants and professionals from across the region where we exchange opportunities, we share uh, you know, board membership opportunities, expert advisory opportunities, consulting opportunities, job opportunities with the members of our ecosystem. So he will post a link to join that group. It's a WhatsApp community. He'll post that around the 25 minute mark and around the 40 minute mark. Um, and then um, we have a, a special offer or gift for the people who have joined us uh, today um, to thank you for uh, being a part of this discussion and that we will post around the 50 minute mark. Um, so without further ado, uh, handing over to Girish uh, and then uh, Nirav uh, to take us through this uh, brilliant session on corporate tax, hopefully brilliant session on corporate tax. Yes, sure, Varun. It will be brilliant. Uh, thanks, Varun, uh, for the introduction. Uh, 
basically as uh, i think there have been a series of uh, awareness sessions that we have conducted on uh, corporate tax and uh, i think like ali mentioned uh, this is a journey that uh, we will be covering uh, from uh, knowing something to knowing uh, you know gaining further mastery and hopefully uh, it's a continuous journey as we see also during the bat now when we talk about the corporate tax uh, journey per se right i think as far as ue is concerned it started with the announcement by uh, you know the ministry of finance around january of uh, no 2022 right where they announced that there would be corporate tax in the ue okay subsequently we have seen uh, a public consultation document and uh, where they basically invited the views from the people in terms of the uh, what the legislation is going to look at look like as far as the corporate tax is concerned right and uh, that document in fact uh, had uh, the i would say the most clarity okay in terms of how the corporate tax would be implemented in uh, uae yeah uh, so subs and then after that uh, around uh, december yeah with despite all the naysayers saying that as we see always right that no 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 it will not be introduced uh, you know so now the corporate tax law is out okay now whenever we talk about legislations it's always divided into uh, multiple uh, you know kind of layers okay so right now what we are seeing is the basic law which has come out okay uh, which has possibly uh, raised more questions than answering them right uh, effectively because it's a bare minimum kind of thing and you know a lot of these questions that people have asked is uh, stemming from the fact that we don't have that in black and white in terms of how it will be addressed okay so that is where possibly we have to place a little bit of reliance on the earlier issued public consultation document where there was a certain amount of uh, clarity but again what we'll have to remember is that this is more a case of a directional thing yeah we still need for us to take the action things in uh, black and white and this is something which would basically come out uh, through the uh, you know what they said this time is that it will be in the form of cabinet decisions okay unlike the vat where an executive regulations came out and where you know in one document we basically had uh, you know spelt out all the further clarifications that is required okay what is expected to happen in the corporate tax is that we will be seeing this in the form of series of cabinet decisions in fact one of the cabinet decisions has already been uh, kind of announced uh, where uh, you know the law did not specify what was the limit as far as the uh, you know corporate tax is concerned uh, however in the cabinet decision now they have clarified uh, you know to say that you know up to 375000 uh, dirhams there is uh, 0% and beyond that it will be 9% so like that there will be a series of cabinet decisions which will further clarify you know as far as the applicability okay maybe like uh, varun mentioned i will quickly run you through in terms of uh, you know who we are uh, and uh, just bear with me i guess uh, the full screen is on now and you are able to see it yeah alvin you can confirm yes we can yeah yeah thank you so uh, we we as mca have been in the uh, you know uae for more than uh, 14 years now okay and uh, primarily uh, we are in uh, five countries uh, we are in ksa qatar bahrain uae and oman right uh, basically in terms of leadership we have got over 300 years of experience okay quite uh, some of them uh, grey haired like me uh, basically we have handled over 1500 plus uh, clients uh, seven direct directors okay and uh, we are a traditional firm okay in terms of our accounting and audit practice simply put uh, we cover the sphere from right from establishing com company and uh, till the liquidation of the entity and intermediate you know the various elements that you know the entity requires as illustrated on the screen right uh, yeah maybe you'll see a familiar face here 
okay so this is our leadership team uh, and this is our management team and and one of them is on the call you know nira right uh, in terms of industries uh, primarily because of our experience and also uh, being in the region for some time i think there is uh, very few industries that we would not have covered and definitely we have covered all the industries that are normally kind of you know having businesses in the gulf right and this is about the uh, five country that uh, we have a presence right uh, the clientele uh, right from multinationals real estate uh, hospitality transportation so we have had a very degree and that could possibly you know at least indicate to you that in terms of the various industries that are there we would have covered most of them right uh, yeah like one mentioned the energy and resource where i spent some years as such okay now we will move on to the presentation at this stage i will hand over to nirav to take it through the details uh, maybe i'll come back for in terms of how do you go about uh, you know kind of implementing the uh, corporate tax as far as uh, your organization is concerned over to you nirav just yes. please stop sharing thank you very much varun and girish for such a wonderful brief on the topic as well as on the profile of the organization i'm sharing my screen so in terms of presentation we will uh, you can say segregate the flow in two ways first is we will cover basics of the uae corporate tax law so first is a corporate tax law and how to prepare and in corporate tax law we will cover first basic and then we will deep dive into little bit specifics of the relevant aspects or which are the specific areas which needs a special attention in terms of corporate tax is concerned so starting with an overview as uh, girish mentioned uh, we had a basically announcement in january then a draft regulation in place somewhere in april and now we already have a corporate tax law applicable in the country in terms of basics so basically what is corporate tax so basic corporate tax is tax on the profits of the business as such in some jurisdiction it is also called as a business profit tax now why the question comes why until now it wasn't there now why what is the reason of introduction of corporate tax there are basically three reasons for the first is uh, for the development of the country second to you can say be to become like a financial hub for the companies as well as there was a global agenda that all the countries should at least collect bare minimum taxes so that the people do not take the advantage of not having a tax in a particular country and conduct their operations from that country so as a global agenda the tax was introduced in the country and now the question comes out okay we already have a vat then the corporate tax is it same or a different so vat is is something which we collect from the customers and pay to the government but as corporate tax is different in that sense it is not required to be collected from the customer it is a tax on your own profits so that way it is not something which you will collect and pay so it will hit to your pnl or basically it will has to hit to your cash flow so that's why it's very important to determine what impact the corporate tax will have in your profits going forward so the next question comes okay now the corporate tax law is there but from where it is effective so the effective is the corporate tax law is effective from the first june any financial year which starts after first june 2023 so i'm repeating any financial year which starts after first june 2023 so what is the financial year so financial year has been defined as any any 12 months period which is followed by a company as its financial year now we'll take an example what if a entity or a business follows a calendar year as a financial year so for them the financial year first financial year which will start after 1st june 2023 would be 1st january 2024 and accordingly the first tax period for them would be jan to december 2024 what if a company or a business follows a april to march as a financial year so such kind of people the tax year the these corporate tax will become applicable from 1st april 2024 
and the first tax period for which they will be liable for compliance and payment would be April 24 to the March 2025. Moving on to what are the rates and how the tax will be calculated. So the tax, there's a threshold of 375,000 dirham. If your taxable income is up to 375,000 dirham, you're not supposed to pay any tax here. However, if the taxable income is more than 375,000 dirham, then only on the excess portion, so taxable income in excess of 375,000 dirham will attract a tax at the rate of 9%. Now, this is very critical. They refer here as a taxable income. So it's different from the accounting profit, which we will derive, which will cover in detail subsequently, what is accounting profit and how to determine taxable income? How do that journey can be, you can say, covered? But basically important term for the purpose of tax is taxable income and not accounting income. It will definitely, it will vary. Now we have given an example. What if a person having a taxable income of 500,000 dirham, then what will be the tax liability of that person? So as I mentioned up to taxable income of 375,000 dirham, there will not be any tax. Income, taxable income in excess of 375,000 dirham. In this case, 125,000 would attract 9% tax and accordingly a person would be required to pay tax of 11,000 to 50 dirhams. Now, a multinational organization, basically a, a, you can say an entity operating in or a group operating in many countries with consolidated turnover, group turnover of 750 million euros would be subject to tax differently. There's a global agenda here that those kind of companies should be subject to minimum tax. These rules will be applicable uh, maybe once it is accepted in the UAE. But presently, since those rules have not been finalized, even the multinational organizations having this revenue would be subjected to this 9% and 0% tax, considering their taxable income in the UAE. Moving on to specifics of the corporate tax law, the important concept or aspect to understand is whether a person is a resident or a non-resident, because depending upon whether you are a resident or a non-resident, the quantum of income which will be taxed in UA will be determined. So now we will have to understand for that purpose who all are resident and who all are non-residents. So the UA corporate tax law says that a resident, so that three type of people will be called as a resident. First is a natural person conducting business or business activity in the UA. Here, business and the carrying on business and business activity is very important term. Presently, the definite there will be a cabinet decision which will specify which kind of business and business activity, which will be because of which the individual individual will be subject to tax in the UAE. So we'll have to watch apart from business or business activity, any individual deriving any other income should not be subject to tax in the UAE. Juridical person means a legal person, any incorporated entity who is registered or, or basically uh, incorporated or registered in the UAE will be treated as a resident. So any company which is incorporated in the UAE, whether in mainland or free zone is considered as a resident. And third, if there is an entity which is incorporated outside India, but that country entity is being controlled and managed from the UAE, that means all the key decisions are being taken from the UAE or the person who are taking a key decision for that entity are resident or they are there in the UAE then even though that entity is incorporated outside India, that foreign entity will be considered as a resident for the purpose of UAE corporate tax law. Now, for a resident, which income would be taxable? So as I mentioned, for a resident, if it's a juridical person, worldwide income would be taxable in the UAE. So wherever that entity, whether that entity is earning income from UAE, UK, US, India, any country, that entity would be subject to tax in the UAE. For a natural person, as I referred uh, earlier, only business and business activity, income which is earned from business or business activity, that would only be taxable in the UAE. Now, we will also understand who all are non-residents. So any person who is not a resident, but having a foreign or, or having, so basically a foreign entity, for an example, having a permanent establishment in the UAE, so for an example, if there is a company which is incorporated outside India, but having a branch or a workshop in UAE and uh, they are operating that from that branch or a workshop, then though that entity is incorporated outside the UAE or in foreign jurisdiction, that entity to the extent of income which is there 
in UA would be subject to tax as a non-resident. Also, income you can say derived from a UA sourced. So there's a separate concern, there's a different concept of UA sourced income. In case a foreign entity or a non-resident person deriving any UA sourced income, he's also be considered as a non-resident person for the purpose of UA corporate tax. And also any non-resident person having the nexus in the UA. Now, what is nexus that has not been defined? And we are expecting a cabinet decision on this. Ideally, or one could relate that if a non-resident person is having or any person who is there outside the UAE, but having any connection, business connection in the UAE could be subject to tax in the UAE if it, that person is earning income after that connection. Now, for a non-resident, unlike a resident where the entire world income is taxable, for a non-resident only, income which is earned from a permanent establishment in the UAE, that is P in the UAE, or UA sourced income, or income attributable to nexus in the UAE. Only these three types of income would be taxed in the UAE and not the world income. So now we have understood who, which type of person are resident and a non-resident. We will also understand who all are exempt person. These type of, so basically exempt person are those who are not subject to corporate tax in the UAE. Now, which are those persons? So basically government entity, basically a government entity who is doing a mandated activity, generally not carrying on a business activity. And accordingly, a government entity is exempt person. Entity which is being controlled by a government entity and carrying on sovereign or mandated activity, basically for the, uh, for the welfare or for the, on behalf of the state, that is a UAE, are also not considered as taxable and they are exempt persons. Then comes, any person engaged in the business of extraction of natural resources or related non-extracting activities, which are subject to tax at Emirates level. If these kind of activities are undertaken, it's already taxed at Emirates level and accordingly those kind of person will be exempt person for the purpose of UA corporate tax law. Then a qualified public benefit entity. So, so these are like charitable trust and institution who does Activity is not for the purpose of business, but for the purpose of public welfare and all. If the ent uh, particular entity meets a certain condition, that entity would be considered as public qualifying entity and would be considered as exempt person. Then a qualifying investment fund meeting certain conditions would also be considered as a exempt person. Then private, public or social security funds, pensions, which are sub subject to regulatory control or oversight are also considered as exempt. And any UA juridical person fully owned or controlled by any of the exempt person. Uh, there will be a, you can say detailed guidelines on this, but this person will also be considered as an exempt person. Being an exempt person, they will not be subject to UA corporate tax. But there's one thing here, not all the incomes earned by this exempt entity would be uh, not subject to taxation. If these entities are doing a business activity, then the business, the income which is generated out of business activity, would be subject to tax in the UAE. So now we have understood who resident, non-resident, also taxable person, exempt person. So now we will also understand which kind of income are not taxable. Basically, this is what we all look out for, which kind of actor will, which kind of income will not attract capital, you basically a corporate tax in the UAE. The so first is any dividend or a profit distribution received from a legal person, which is a resident in the UAE. So for an example, if you are receiving a dividend from a UA entity incorporated in the UAE, that would be exempt for the purpose of UA corporate tax. Dividend and other profit distributions received from a participation interest in a foreign legal person. So if you're receiving a dividend from a foreign company, whether it's an exempt or, or taxable, that will de determine whether it's a qualifying participating interest. So what is participating interest in? That means the you are having the shareholding of less than or not less than 5% in that entity. And that for the shares are being held for 12 months or you intend to held them for share uh, more than 12 months or 12 months or more. And that entity in who shares your, the, the share you're holding, that entity is subject to tax at least at 9%. If these conditions are satisfied that then whatever income you derive from those shares will be considered as a participating, qualifying participating interest. And accordingly, that would be exempt from the UA corporate tax law. Other income from a participating interest, basically capital gain and all, 
which you want, whether from a resident person, basically a company in the UAE or any foreign company would be exempt if you fulfill that participation interest criteria here as well. Income of a permanent foreign permanent establishment. So it's also exempt, but there are conditions. This needs to be elected. So I'll explain this as an example. If there is an entity in the UAE and it is having a branch in UK. So UK branch would be considered as a PE in UK. And accordingly, that branch would be subject to tax in the UK. Now being a branch of this entity, that branch also would be taxed in the UAE because branch and head office is one in the same. So now the UAE entity will have an option either to include the branch in the branch, the UK branch income in the UA income, or it can claim an exemption for that income. The exemption can only be claimed if that UK branch was subject to tax at least at 9% in that country. So this is the condition which has to be fulfilled. The last one is income derived by a non resident from operating uh, or a leasing aircraft or a ship used in international transportation and the reciprocity principle. So these are the income which are specifically mentioned as an in exempt income. And accordingly, you will not be required to pay tax on this. Since these incomes are exempt, any expenditure which you are incurring to earn this income would also not be allowed as a deductible expenditure. Moving on. So which kind of expense? Okay, now the taxable income, the calculation of taxable income comes into picture. How do we uh, calculate that? So basically we will take accounting profit as a base. We will allow the expenses which are allowable for the, we'll claim the deduction for expenses which are allowable and the expenses which are not allowed would be added back. That way we will derive the taxable income. Now we will understand which kind of expenditure are allowed. So all the legitimate business expenditure which are incurred and which are revenue in nature would be allowable. Fees paid to local and federal government is also allowed as a deduction. Irrecoverable input VAT, basically an input VAT which we do not claim as a reduction for while, while calculating our VAT liability in the UAE. So that input VAT you can claim as a business deduction. Expenditure with dual purpose, assuming there is an expenditure which has business as well as a personal use, then only to the extent of business use, you can claim that expenditure, the personal use, the expenditure which relates to, relates to personal use will have to be disallowed. For an example, expenditure on car, mobile phones, etc. Entertainment expenditure, any expenditure incurred towards meals, accommodation for customer supplier are considered as uh, for the purpose of UA corporate tax law as an entertainment expenditure. Only 50% would be allowed as a deduction. If you all recollect, there's a similar provisions are there in VAT, but in VAT, we are not allowed to take any input re VAT recovery for those expenditures. At least in corporate tax, the 50% is allowed as a deduction. Now we will under or we will also understand which expenditures are not allowed. So any donations, grants, gifts, which has been given to other than qualifying public benefit entity. We learned in the earlier slide deck that what will be considered as a qualifying public benefit entity. If the donation or grant is given to any entity which is not a qualifying public benefit entity, then that will not be allowed as a business deduction. Bribes, signs, penalty, obviously these are all illicit payments, so cannot be claimed as a deduction. Dividend paid by UAE companies. So since the dividend is appropriation of your profit, you, the company cannot claim dividend distributed as its expense, deductible expense. Corporate tax or income tax imposed outside UAE. So assuming the company is supposed to withhold tax or a business profit tax in other countries, those taxes cannot be claimed as a deductible business expenditure, but while calculating a tax liability, the credit of those taxes can be claimed. We will cover that subsequently when we come to the calculation of taxable income. And input VAT recoverable, the input VAT for which the recovery is claimed while determining VAT liability. That means the deduction is claimed. Obviously we can't claim that as a deduction and that's why it has to be disallowed. Now with respect to interest expenditure, there are specific rules. So general rule and specific rule. General rule says that any interest expenditure in excess of 30% of EBITDA, that means earning before interest tax, depreciation and amortization, excluding exempt income. If your interest expenditure is more than 30% of EBITDA and exempt income, then that excess will have to be disallowed, but it's not a total disallowance or you can say complete disallowance, permanent disallowance, that excess which you have disallowed for this year 
can be carried forward to a next 10 tax years and many can be claimed as a set of in those years. Now this general rule is not applicable if the net interest expenditure doesn't, is not, uh, you can say is, is not crossing the threshold, then this threshold will be notified subsequently. But if your th interest expenditure, net interest expenditure is less than this threshold, you will not have to work on this disallowance. Also the banks and financial institutions are not subject to this provision because obviously the lending and all this is their business. So according to these provisions are not applicable. Specific rules are also there. If you are borrowing a loan from your related party, group companies, for, say for example, then if that loan is used to fund an exempt income, basically if we have the loans are used to distribute dividend, or uh, you can say uh, with any uh, distribution which does not act at a tax in the UA, then that interest will not be allowed as a deduction. Free zones. Now we all are aware free zones has a special importance in the UA. And that's why free zones are, there are spe specific provisions which covers taxability of free zones. Free zones, the law says that free zones will be sub will be getting a benefit of 0% corporate tax. However, only on the qualifying income. So now we will have to understand for the purpose of 0% corporate tax benefit, the free zone needs to be a qualifying free zone and needs to be earning qualifying income. So first we will understand what is a qualifying free zone. So any free zone, so there are criteria which are laid down. This condition needs to be fulfilled. If the conditions are fulfilled, then the free zone becomes a qualifying free zone. So what are those conditions? The qualifying free zone is a free zone which maintains adequate substance in the UAE. We all are aware that in UAE we have a, a, that substance rule, economic substance rule. This conditions somewhere, maybe the detailed rules are awaited, but possibly the ESR regulations are there. If the fulfill the regulations are complied with, possibly this condition to some extent can be made. Then free zone deriving a qualifying income. Now, what is qualifying income? That has not been defined so far. We get some clarity when we refer a public consultation document. This qualify what is qualifying income will be defined subsequently by way of a cabinet decision, which we'll have to wait for. And the free zone has not elected to be subject to corporate tax at 9%. So there may be a criteria, you can say there may be a circumstances under which free zone, considering the overall group or having entities in many jurisdictions, a free zone may decide to subject to tax at 9% rather than opting for a 0%. The, that option has been exercised, then the free zone will not be considered as a qualifying free zone. And the last, complying, the free zone complies with transfer pricing regulations. So basically transfer pricing regulations is all the dealings with your related parties needs to be at arm's length, that is at the value which you will trade with a third party. So now the taxability of income of qualifying free zone, zero person as far as income is subject is you can say fulfills the condition of qualifying income. And if there's any other income, which doesn't fulfill the conditions of becoming a qualifying income, that income would be subject to 9% corporate tax. And multinational corporations that as we sp spoke earlier, if multinational corporations forming a group which is having a global turnover of more than 750 million euro would be subject to tax a different way, but that would be specified in, you can say due course of time. Corporate tax registration, yes, free zones are also required to obtain uh, corporate tax registration and do the compliances, whether they are in qualifying free zone or they are non-qualifying free zone entity. Now we have covered a couple of important, there are other couple of areas which needs an attention or which are relevant when we go for a UI corporate tax. I'll try to cover them. Tax groups. This is also very important aspect because similar thing we have for a VAT. In VAT also we can form a tax group and we do the compliance as a group. Similarly, like VAT, we have also here an option to form a tax group for the purpose of corporate tax. However, the conditions are different. So if you have formed a tax group, whether you are required to mandatorily form a tax group for a corporate tax, the answer is no. Whether the tax group which you have formed for a VAT can be same as corporate tax, the answer is also no. So what are the conditions for forming a tax group for the purpose of corporate tax? The tax group can be formed only between resident group companies. So only entities which are 
incorporated or registered in the UAE can form a tax group. And also, the holding, the parent uh, should be a resident in the UAE and should be holding 95% in those entities. If these conditions are satisfied, then only the tax group can be formed. Tax group cannot include entities which are in free zones or basically which are subject to 0% corporate tax. Obviously, because they are not subject to tax, they cannot be a part of the group. Also, the benefit of forming tax group is that the tax group will be considered as a single taxable person. As a result of which, you will only be required to file a one single tax return. And the income of a tax group will be determined on a consolidation basis. And whatever transactions were there in between the group companies will be eliminated while uh, determining the taxable income of the group. Tax loss relief. So what happens? Okay, the entity has not earned an income, but there was a loss in that year. But any benefit is available? The answer is yes. The tax, in case the entity has incurred a tax loss during the year, the tax loss can be carried forwarded for indefinite period and can be set off or relief can be claimed of that loss against the taxable period where that entity earns taxable income. However, the conditions are that the maximum tax loss which can be set off is 75% of the taxable income. And another condition is that the tax loss can be carried forward and set off only if the shareholding remains, it doesn't change for more than 50%. That means the shareholders in the year in which the tax loss was incurred, at least 50% of those remain same till the time the year in the year we come when we set off this loss. And second, if there's a change in shareholder, the same or similar business activities carried on by that entity. If these conditions are fulfilled, the tax loss relief can be claimed. We have an interesting uh, concept here as a tax loss transfer. So it gives an option of a, to a one taxable person who is incurring loss to transfer that loss to another taxable person who is having a taxable income. And that loss can be set off against the another person's income. We don't see this in many jurisdictions. Only we see tax loss relief means my loss, I have incurred a loss in earlier year, I can set off in the, in the subsequent years, but not the loss incurred by one different person can be set off against the income of different person. This is a really welcome provision. Here also the condition is that at least the maximum loss which can be set off is restricted to 75%. And there are also the similar conditions that the shareholding in both these entities should be at least 75%, same or one is holding 75% in another there cannot be a free zone entity or exempt entity who is not subject to tax or subject to 0% taxes. Both fellows the same financial year and same accounting standard, all those conditions are there, which needs to be fulfilled. Transaction, now we'll talk about one of the most important aspect of the UA corporate tax law. That's it, transfer pricing. Now the transfer pricing provisions are applicable when a company deals with a related parties or a connected person. So in general terms, I would say who all are related parties. So if there's a group of companies, then all the group companies which are there in the group would be considered as a related party. Whether those entities are situated in the UAE or outside the UAE, all will be considered as a related parties. Also, if you are a, okay, so now we'll talk about connected person. The owners, shareholders of the entities are considered as a connected person. So any payment made, to related parties or connected person who will be subject to transfer pricing regulation. What that means, so you can't trade at any value which a company decides. The transaction needs to be at value which is commensurate with the value at which you will deal with a third party. And there are different methods which are prescribed considering the nature of the transaction. Method needs to be selected and the calculation needs to be made and determine whether the transfer price, the value is commensurate with the transfer pricing value or not. In case of any variation, the company may require to make the adjustment while calculating the taxable income. Now, this is one important aspect. The corporate tax law provision says that opening balance of the first tax period of the entity needs to be aligned with the transfer pricing. So this indirectly leads to a uh, exercise of transfer pricing being required to be undertaken prior to the first tax period. So if the business is assuming for a business, a tax for tax period 2024, then that can, the business can evaluate the transfer pricing implications in 2023. All the transactions can be, now you can see arrange in line with the transfer pricing regulations. 
and then that way the opening balance can be aligned with the transfer pricing regulations. Now going to the next important aspect of general anti-abuse rule. So general anti-abuse rules, this is the only provision which is already applicable. Though for a business, a tax, first tax period may start in 2024, maybe Jan or April, depending upon the financial year they are following, but GAR provisions are already applicable to all the taxable person. Now what these provisions are? So basically, if any person is trying to structure a transaction or an arrangement just to take the corporate tax benefit and it doesn't have an economic substance or a reality, then the transaction, the revenue authority can disregard that transaction and then the transaction would be taxed as if the transaction had not taken place, that arrangement had not taken place. This is very important. Once we come to know corporate tax law, is there we will try to restructure our transaction so that we have a limited impact on our profitability and we have a less tech implication. But we will also have to consider this grasp GAR provision. In case the arrangement is carried on with the sole purpose of corporate tax advantage, we will be subject to scrutiny by FTA and the implications are very severe. So this needs to be taken care of. Small business relief, considering the objective that small businesses doesn't need to do a lot more compliances, which UAE doesn't want them to do. The provisions are introduced. In case there is a taxable person is deriving a taxable income, which may be exceeding the threshold of 375,000. But if that person is deriving a turnover or in the preceding years and the current year, which does not exceed a particular threshold, which will be specified, then that person would be eligible to claim the small business relief. And accordingly, he can say, okay, I'm having a taxable income, but I'm claiming this relief and I would be considered as a not taxable person and accordingly relieved from all the compliances. Now, a couple of uh, administrative aspect in terms of registration. Yes, all the taxable persons are required to take registration before filing the cop first corporate tax return. There's no threshold. Every taxable person is required to take registration. Existing VAT registration, Registrants are also required to take corporate tax registration because VAT and corporate tax are different laws and according to the registration also needs to be obtained separately. Uh, and in case we discontinue carry on businesses or you can say entities are wound up, then we are required to deregister our uh, corporate tax registration. When do we have to file a corporate tax return is the next question. So nine months from the end of the taxable tax year tax period basically. If I am following Jan to December financial year, then I have to file my return within nine months, that's a sub September of the next year. And then transfer pricing documentation also may be required to be filed, but we'll have to wait for a detailed regulations on this. Tax payment is also required to be made if the person is having a taxable tax liability, corporate tax liability. The payment, the timeline for payment is same as we have for the filing of corporate tax return, nine months from the end of the tax period. And presently there are no provisions for advanced payment of corporate tax. And also in case the businesses have paid excess taxes, the refund can be claimed. Now the important uh, aspect which needs to be understood is the tax credit. If I calculate my taxable income, can I get any credits against that? Because I'm paying taxes in other countries or I may be subject to taxes in the UAE itself. So yes, in case of taxes paid in the UAE or foreign country, the credits are available. However, for a taxes which are paid outside the UAE, the credit is restricted to only the tax liability of that income in the UAE. So assuming you have paid for tax in the foreign country of 50, but here the, in the UAE, the tax liability of that income is only 30, then you can only claim a credit up to 30 and not more than that. Assessment, the provisions have to be, you can say, specified, but the taxable person, the tax return filed by the taxable person may be subject to assessment by the revenue authorities. Now, we'll just understand how to calculate taxable income. As I mentioned while starting my presentation, that your accounting profit and your taxable income would differ in most of the cases. And we have just, uh, now we'll understand with an example, so our calculation will start with accounting profit. We will take what is their net profit and losses per account, books of accounts. We will make an adjustment for unrealized losses or basically any losses or gains which are not unrealized, I have an option 
to claim it as a, either a taxable or not taxable, depending upon whether capital or revenue. If I don't claim in that unrealized losses are not allowable as a deduction, I'll add back those losses. I'll claim reduction for a income which are exempt. So we understood the capital return, capital gains and dividends are exempt. If I have that income, I'll reduce that. Also, I will disallow the expenses which are not allowable as deductible expenses. For an example, personal expenses, entertainment expenses. Also, if I have a transaction with related parties or a connected person, which are not as arm's length, I will make an adjustment for that. And after considering all these adjustment, I'll come to my taxable income. So in this case, my accounting profit is uh, 1 million EAD, the RAM, but when I come to taxable income, it's 1.2 million EAD. So you will see it's different. It will not be same as my accounting income. On that income, taxable income, at 375,000 dirham, I will not pay any tax. Income in excess of 375,000 dirham, I will pay tax at 9%. That tax liability comes to 76,500 dirhams. Now I may have paid taxes in foreign countries. So I will claim a credit for those taxes to the extent of taxability in the UA. So assuming it's 10,000, I'll reduce that amount. And effectively from bank account, I will have to make the payment of 66,500 dirham as a corporate tax payment. So yeah, that's all. Now we have understood all the important provisions as well as basics of the UA corporate tax law. After understanding that how a business can go about, how to prepare, how to, you can say, cover this journey from today to the tax period in which the corporate tax will be applicable. For this, I will now request Girish if he can please share uh, thoughts on it. Yeah, Nero, keep the slide. We'll run through here to save time. Sure. sure. Okay, if you move on to the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so just keep here. Yeah. So I think uh, we have understood the basics and the uh, nuances of the corporate tax uh, from Europe, right? Uh, obviously, the next question is that how do we uh, really prepare uh, for the uh, corporate tax as such? Okay, so generally, these are the four uh, perspectives that you have is that, you know, do you need to bother now or, uh, you know, you can still wait? Okay, I think uh, this is a journey that people uh, travel in terms of their uh, knowledge. Okay, what I would say is that currently we have an understanding of about 60 to 70 uh, percent okay, in terms of how the corporate tax will be applied, right? Uh, so in that sense, uh, we would recommend that you start uh, preparing for the corporate tax uh, implementation. Right, uh, we will cover in detail why we should bother now. Just if you can move to the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. So you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, basically the, uh, you know, as far as direct taxes are concerned, this is something that uh, we have not been, you know, basically been, uh, you know, kind of exposed to in this part of the world. So that is where uh, we now need to prepare for that. And considering from few of the questions that have come on the chat also, obviously there is this understanding that we need to develop. But more importantly, I think uh, one thing which will happen, of course, when VAT came in, there was a certain amount of streamlining that happened in terms of the accounting practices as such. Uh, but what we have seen in our practice is that largely there is Largely people are okay, but uh, there are still people who are, you know, just looking at their uh, sales invoice and the purchase invoice and based on, based on that, they tend to do their uh, VAT filing, right? And uh, maybe they are not getting into kind of drawing up accounts. So this is something that they need to uh, kind of now get into because as we would have seen in the example of the calculation of the corporate tax, the so-called indirect method always starts with the, you know, the accounting profit that you make. And obviously, whenever you talk about the accounting profit, that would require you to maintain the books of accounts. Okay, when you uh, come to the audits, uh, although the law currently states that it depends on each of the jurisdictions in terms of what the, uh, you know, the requirements are in terms of audit, okay, but the way we see it is that this is something that would become a norm uh, because as in, as the corporate tax matures, 
you know, there would be the requirement possibly from the authorities in terms of getting an independent view of your accounting books. Okay, and that's where the audits may get uh, compulsory at some uh, point in time. Okay, definitely, I think uh, in the public consultation document, they had spoken about uh, free zones possibly to necessarily get their accounts audited. Okay, but that's not there in the law. So, yes, it's a gray area, but uh, directionally, it's always better to get your books audited so that you establish a greater amount of credibility as far as the accounts or the tax returns that you file. Okay, more importantly, I think uh, when we talk about uh, it's an impact on the business sustainability and profitability because now whatever you are earning, there is an impact of 9% on your uh, profitability. Okay, so obviously uh, you wouldn't like to basically earn 9% uh, or 10% lower than what you are earning. So obviously then you need to start thinking about, okay, what is it that you need to do so that either you maintain the same level of profitability or increase your profitability. Every business wants to increase its profitability. So here is by you not doing anything, you are, you know, there is a, your bottom line is eroded by 9% starting from possibly uh, June 2023, again, like depending upon the year you are. Okay. The other part of it is this is relevant in case of large organizations in terms of, you know, how do you want to structure it, right? Now, there are the complications of whether it's a mainland entity, it's a free zone entity. Okay. Uh, would you basically form a tax group or uh, look at it as separate entities, right? So these all decisions need to be basically uh, taken, right? I think more importantly also, uh, there is one element which was put in the corporate tax law is which referred to in terms of your, you know, the opening balances uh, basically need to reflect transfer pricing, okay? So entities which have got a lot of related party transactions, right? And uh, if uh, you have never been exposed to this, uh, you know, new terminology called transfer pricing, right? Now, that is something that you will have to consider and start preparing for uh, a transfer pricing. And the uh, domain of transfer pricing is, uh, you know, quite vast. Okay, so which requires you to do uh, various filing. It requires you to do, uh, you know, not filing, maintain various documentations. And it requires you to do possibly do benchmarking to ensure that the, you know, the transfer pricing or so-called arm's length is uh, basically reflective of your market pricing as such. Yeah, so these are the reasons where possibly you need to start, uh, like we say, as of yesterday. Okay, Nero, we can move to the next slide. Right, and uh, these are standard risk. You can quickly the whole slide. Uh, these are standard risks that you want to learn. Yeah, obviously, you know, like we say, for any kind of a project or anything that you want to do, you want to allow enough time for you to prepare. Right. If you are having an inadequate understanding of the legislation that is not really pardoned by the authorities, I think you basically are possibly rewarded in terms of fines. Right. Uh, so the tax treatment of transactions are something that you need to understand so that you understand the implications and accordingly prepared. Right. In case of medium to large organizations, obviously, we are also looking at you know, because you will have to scan through your entire accounting records and kind of determine what is the extent of allowability and, you know, what is not allowed, right? That's where possibly you also want to build in your control system so that you could move from your accounting profit to your tax profit, basically maybe by using systems or at least identifying the transactions which could have the tax implications. Next. Right. So, in this is a standard implementation methodology where, if you look at it, uh, we focus on the key pillars of one structure where it where the organizations are complex. They need to look at how the structures and all. Okay, we spoke about the system and uh, transaction process, right? Largely from a perspective of medium to large organizations, where if you want to automate the process, then you need to look at it. How can you kind of prepare your organization for the corporate tax? Training and communication, okay, one of the things that you're doing now is actually getting the awareness and hopefully you kind of become the chain agent within your organization and bring about the communication. But what we are also saying is that when we look at organizations, this is not just the domain of the finance person as such, but it's about the leadership and also possibly the whole organization being aware of what the impact of 
corporate tax is on their bottom lines as such. Okay, this is the so-called, uh, you know, plan of how you could possibly go about the implementation on a very broad basis. And this is assuming that, you know, it's a financial year from Jan to December. So your, you know, the implementation year is actually Jan 2024, right? So what we are saying is that as of now, you should be, you know, kind of doing your preliminary impact assessments, right? Based on the information that is available, right? As we mentioned that there would be the cabinet decisions which are likely to flow in the next two, three months, right? As in, so once those clarity emerges, that's where you can possibly look at the detailed impact assessments uh, as the implementation is concerned. Okay, then you kind of actually dwell into in terms of the implementation phase, whether in terms of a structure, whether in terms of a system, whether in terms of you know transactions, whether in terms of communications, right? Largely internal communications. So these part of it can be implemented. Now FTA basically allows you to register for corporate tax up to, for example, in the case of Jan to December, it allows you to register up to September 2025. Now that's a lot of time. Okay, maybe that is something that you could look at it from a registration perspective, but I think it is uh, more important in terms of the preparation part of it uh, as to how uh, you can uh, get prepared. I can see a question here, so where maybe I'll take this question right away. Is the registration open on MRR tax? So right now it is basically open for uh, public joint stock companies and the uh, private entities. Uh, but I think uh, the parameter here is that First, you need to do your planning and then possibly go in for the uh, registrations. That would be what we would advise. Right. I think, yeah, these are coordinates uh, in terms of if you want to get in touch with us as such. Okay. With that, uh, we come to the end of our presentation. Sorry, we are slightly overstepped on the time, but no, I think you're we are happy. still good enough for 15 minutes as such. Yes, you're per perfectly on time. I think it's exactly four o'clock. So, you know, I have three quick things to do before we open for questions and answers. One, we'd like to take a photo with all of you. All of you have spent some time and, um, you know, this is something I really like doing. So if you don't mind, can you switch off, uh, switch on your cameras rather and then um, fix your hair, uh, make sure you look good for this photo. Uh, Alvin, can you quickly remove us from the spotlight, Girish, Nirav and me? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Okay, perfect. So we have all of you. So I'll give you 10 more seconds to fix your hair if you have hair. And then yeah, maybe we can it. also smile as such. So just and to indicate that smile. they had a good session. Yeah. So one, two, three, tax. Is that what you have to say? So one, two, three, tax. Perfect. So I've I've captured that. Um Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, two quick announcements uh, before we close out and uh, or uh, open for questions and answers. Uh, so one is Alvin will paste now a couple of um, uh, links. Uh, one is the link for the WhatsApp ecosystem that we have created where we share opportunities, board membership opportunities, consulting opportunities, job opportunities. So feel free to join that group. Alvin will paste it again. Second, some of you had some very specific questions uh, about how tax applies to your business. Uh, MCA is kindly offering a one-hour uh, free tax session uh, to answer those specific questions. So please, Arun will paste that on the chat. Please fill it so that you can get uh, uh, you know, some free advice, let's say, from MCA for a while, for about one hour. Um, and then... Uh, feel free to unmute yourself uh, and ask any questions that you still have remaining that are unanswered. Uh, so just maybe raise your physical hand or your Zoom hand. And if you have any questions, we're available for the next 10 minutes or so uh, to answer any questions. Try and keep the more specific questions for a one-on-one -on -one session with us. If you have slightly more generic questions, that, that will help the rest of the audience as well. I think Sonia asked one question. Maybe I told her that they'll do it uh, later. Right, sure. about adequate substance. Yeah, Sonia. So she's on the screen. Uh, yeah, Sonia, is that yeah. something that you want to ask? 
yeah, she's smiling. So I'll answer the question. Uh, yeah, she's now on. You want to ask uh, specifically, Sony? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember what it was I asked now. That's why. I'd yeah, like it was adequate. Question. It was an adequate substance, right? So I think okay. it was in the context of uh, the qualifying uh, free zone, right? Uh, so when we refer to ad adequate substance, it goes back to the ESR uh, perspective. Yeah. So generally, there are the three parameters of uh, primarily that the uh, you know the place that you have a you know office right you have adequate people and the uh, as far as the decisions are concerned those are primarily being taken in the UAE so those are the three parameters that would apply which is there in the ESR regulation okay um yes although usually it's um refers to multiple companies correct so ESR is li largely a, you know, what do you call the compliance, which is required uh, for, okay, most of the industries here are in the distribution and service. So if you are either importing from a related party or you are supplying services to a related party outside of the country, right? That is where the ESR would generally apply. Okay, largely as such. There are the other parameters of financial services, you know, which are not getting to as such because in the general audience, I think will largely fall under distribution and services. All right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, there was a question about, um, you know, what does income mean as how, how and how is it different from profit? So I think Nirav, you explained it really well, uh, of course, but if you just want to quickly reiterate for anyone who didn't get that. Yeah. So basically as we saw, you have another profit or loss as per your books of accounts. That is, we will call it as accounting profit. After that, we'll make an adjustment, a couple of adjustments. First, we will look at the expenses. Expenses which are not allowed, we will disallow those expenses. So expense, sorry, for an example, fines, penalties, interest expenditure in excess of 30% of EBITDA, such kind of entertainment expenses. I will disallow such kind of expenses. Then I will see my income side. Am I earning any income which is exempt? I will reduce that. So in a nutshell, if I do do these activities, then I'll come to taxable income. And that's where how do we cover your journey from tax uh, accounting profit to a taxable income? Of course, M makes sense. Um, what is the likely accounting standard we will follow, IFRS or another system? Uh, that's from Arun from ALMT Legal. So as such, UA corporate tax law does not prescribe any uh, specific accounting standard to be followed. It is mentioned that any accounting standard which are generally allowed in the UAE can be followed. So that's up to the business. The most applicable accounting standard and accepted in the UAE can be followed. There are no such conditions. So here, largely, they are, you know, what we tend to follow is the IFRS. But uh, like Nero mentioned, if any other accounting standard is being followed, it is uh, it is not uh, disallowed. Understood. Um, so Saad uh, Askari asked a question, and uh, anybody, of course, we've uh, you know gone over four p.m. So please feel free to leave if you don't have any questions that you still like uh, you would like answered. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending as well. But if you have any questions unanswered, we we're still here for ten minutes to answer them. So uh, maybe Saad, if you want to get uh, more information also, you can stay back as for the 10 minutes. Of course. So Saad Askari is asking Girish, uh, free zone entities that qualify under qualifying income of 0%, will the other income have to cross the threshold of AD 375,000 to be taxed at 9% uh, corporate tax rate? So you, know, you want to answer that? <laughs> Okay, so basically, as we saw in the presentation, income, free zone entity, qualifying free zone entity, earning any income, which is not a qualifying income, would be straightforward subject to 9% without any threshold. Because for that uh, income, there is no threshold which is specified. So that threshold of 375,000 is not available if I'm a free zone entity. Oh, though I'm a qualifying free zone entity, but I am deriving an income which is not a qualifying income. Understood. 
Um, there is a question around from Rob uh, saying, how are DIFC, ADGM viewed, considered free zones or separate legal structures? Yeah, I answered it online. Uh, but anyway, uh, just for the benefit of everybody. So basically, we expect them to be treated as uh, free zone entities, right? Uh, now, again, the what they have done is that possibly they have put in the definition of qualifying free zone and qualifying income. Uh, these need to be further uh, clarified in the, you know, the cabinet decisions. Understood. Uh, any other questions, anyone, uh, before we close out? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, thank you, Sabir. You're saying excellent and precise session, so thank you for that. Um, Sorry, can I ask something quick? Of course, Sonia. What if a free zone company does business with both free zone and mainland? How does that affect tax? So when you look, if it does with the free zone entity only, okay, again, these have not been specified. I take the thing of from the public consultation document, okay, where uh, primarily what they have done is that if it is dealing with the free zone entity, it would be considered 0%, okay? Uh, whereas if there is a mainland related dealing, uh, that particular thing is supposed to be at 9%. Okay, although this session is recorded, but I will keep my caveat on this one until <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. So you'd have to split the sale basically and say- Yeah, it's, it's 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 yeah they have said about qualifying. See, what happened in the law, for the difference between the public consultation document and the law was there came a terminology of qualifying income. Okay, whereas earlier in the public consultation, it was that if you were dealing with the mainland, everything was at 9%. Right. When the law came in, they brought in this concept of qualifying income and non-qualifying income. So directionally, it seems to be suggesting that if your mainland dealings that may come under non-qualifying income, and there would be an element of qualifying income at zero percent, so which would mean that you know the accountants will have a field day of actually calculating you know the zero percent yeah. right up to the bottom line. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. You guys are going to have fun with us. Yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, as we're justifying our degrees that we took, the professional degrees. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, Marilu, do you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. For the presentation it was nice and clear. I just wanted to uh, confirm because we have a client in KSA which withholds 5% withholding tax from all our, uh, from all of their payment to us. So can we uh, treat that as a deductible from our corporate tax, a tax credit? Yeah. So I'm assuming that we are uh, so we are incorporated in the UAE. And we are uh, we are a legal entity in the UAE. And accordingly, we'll be taxed in the UAE. So whatever income we are earning from KSA, that will come will be subject to nine percent tax. Again, that tax liability you can claim. A credit for taxes which are withheld by your KSA customer. So okay. that credit will be available. But okay. again, the credit would be restricted to, okay, your KSA income, if effectively it's taxed at, say for example, the amount comes to 10 rupee, 10 uh, dirham, 10 dirham. And the taxes are withheld, which are 20 in dirham. You will only get the credit of 10 dirham and not more than that. Yes, whatever is well, just whatever is the revenue, like a revenue and then five percent of that is yeah. the so we can claim that. If we can claim that because that income also would be it will be required to be included when yes. you calculate your taxable income of UAE. Yes, and then uh, are there like uh, substantiate or documents, uh, approved document that will. Uh, attach in the return or so presently there are no requirements which are laid down but ideally for a ta foreign tax in case if it's a withholding tax obviously that KSA customer will give you a withholding tax certificate which will justify that this is what they have paid and also that has been rem you can say remitted to the government of KSA uh, so such kind of documents can be used as evidence okay. for the purpose of cre claiming credit thank you sir. Okay, I will take one last question if, if that's okay. What is qualifying income? I guess this has not been clarified yet. Saad Askari is asking. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah so you are absolutely right what is qualifying income has not been defined however we are taking a clue from a definition or a understanding which was given in the public consultation document however for the purpose of impact obviously you can take a clue but we'll have to watch out for the cabinet decision which will specifically mention which kind of income would be considered as a qualifying income yeah one last bit uh, i think soel is asking and maybe because we mentioned about our degree right so i think uh, yeah to answer his question he is talking about whether the corporate tax returns can be prepared anybody other than a qualified uh, accountant i think the fta is pretty clear that you know it's a self assessment mode right uh, so everybody can choose to basically submit their corporate tax returns as such okay uh, just with the word of caution that you know what you're doing yeah so because once you're submitting your returns like we have seen with the vat right subsequent to that if you have to do anything they are in the form of uh, voluntary disclosures so that is where if you are clear about what you are doing you are definitely i think that you have the prerogative to do your own uh, you know corporate tax returns yeah but better to get it done from mca right <laughs> yeah, that's just a joke of course uh, irish's <laughs> answer is the correct one so um perfect so um with this uh, you know i uh, hey, there uh, is one, one more question if that's okay girish uh, or dhananjay i think uh, he's just yeah. on his mic so maybe we can take that correct yes. dhananjay let's Sorry. go ahead with the last question and then last, we... last question for me please <laughs> thank you so much uh, uh, first of all thank you varun thank you girish uh, it's been really uh, informative and very useful session um, i'll just i'll just ask one quick question we we are just starting out in saudi uh, and uh, uh, you might have answered this when you explained but i just want to answer in context to our own company so we have we are starting out in saudi and obviously when uh, this company will be taxed in saudi uh, but this is a branch company of our uae company which is a free zone company by the way uh, we understand that uh, let's say when he said qualifying income from what he guesses that if we are selling to customers in the mainland that income might uh, might not be qualified that might be taxable if we are selling it let's say to someone in free zone that might be not taxable for the uae company itself uh, but its branch is here in ksa which will be taxed in ksa uh, so uh, will the will 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 this will have to pay the tax for this branch company of ksa in uae as well uh, or how how exactly will it, will it work uh, Yeah, I yeah. hope the question is clear. Yeah, I will uh, try to answer your question. So very simple, branch is nothing but an extension of a head office. So your free zone entity having a branch there, obviously the branch income would be clubbed with your free zone entity's income as far as UAE corporate tax law is concerned. Now whether that income would be a qualifying income or not, that we will have to see. If it's a qualifying income, you will be subject to zero percent tax. it's a non qualifying income it will again be subject to tax in the uae but obviously as a, a question was raised earlier you will obviously get the credit for whatever taxes you have paid in ksa to the extent of the to the extent tax of liability. the taxable amount yeah tax liability whatever tax you pay in uae on that income branch income to that extent you will have you will get the credit so effectively if the taxes are paid are higher in ksa then you will not be doubly taxed on that income this is one aspect second we also spoke about foreign pe foreign permanent establishment so branch in case may be treated as a foreign permanent establishment for free zone entity you can opt to take exemption from that branch pe income so you can decide if that income is taxed more than 9% in case you can opt i want to claim an exemption by which you will not be required to include that income neither those expenses can be cleared do you don't need to even claim the credit so that exemption option also remains with you understood understood it's clear thank you perfect thank you so much everyone for attending today thank you so much nirav and girish for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and uh, we will send out the recording to everyone uh, who's attended um so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions we're available to help and support uh with uh 
with your corporate taxes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.